Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. I'd like to thank those of you that have contributed to the Patreon for the podcast. I really appreciate the support. You can check out the link on the podcast page if you're interested or go directly to www.patreon.com backslash KIS Organics. My guest this week is Reggie Gaudino. Reggie is the Chief Science Officer for Steep Hill Laboratories. Dr. Gaudino oversees all scientific research and development for Steep Hill and is the driving force for Steep Hill's genetic research program. Dr. Gaudino directed a team of researchers, which led to the development of GenKit, the first cannabis DNA-based sex kit. The research from Dr. Gaudino has been peer-reviewed and published, leading to important new discoveries in the cannabis industry. Dr. Gaudino received his BS in molecular biology and a PhD in molecular genetics from the State University of New York at Buffalo, and he conducted four years of postdoctoral research at Washington University in St. Louis, studying transcriptional regulation of rRNA. Reggie was one of the first African-American molecular biologists to enter a PhD program in the United States in 1985. I really enjoyed my conversation with Reggie, and we ran out of time to discuss Steep Hill and some of his current work. I plan on following up with him for a second part to this interview. Anyway, on to the show. Hey, Reggie, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ted. I appreciate uh, being able to come on and talk to your your clients, or or rather your your listeners. Yeah, well, I know we've already started chatting prior to starting the show here, uh, but I wanted to really dive in talking a little bit about your background and how you came into uh, sort of this role in the cannabis industry and let listeners know sort of who you are and what you're doing. Okay, so uh, I guess I, I'll start by um, officially who I am. I'm Reggie Godino. I'm, I'm now the president of Steep Hill. I've been there going on almost five years. Um, I came in, believe it or not, as a intellectual property consultant, which was at the time what I, I was really doing for a living. Um, I had been I have been for the last 22 years uh, in the intellectual property field, going from litigation to prosecution, which means that uh, I started kind of prosecuting biotech patents, um, or sorry, litigating uh, biotech patents. Uh, I was hired because of my scientific background where there was early technology in the in, in the biotech industry was uh, centered around certain things like um, moving genes from one organism to another. That was what Monsanto did uh, big time and, and a number of other uh, early startup uh, biotech ad, com- ad companies. Um, and there's a technology that requires that you kind of take a gene and re-edit it. And by that I mean um, different organisms use different codons for uh, calling for an amino acid. And by that I mean certain amino acids, let's say alanine, <clears throat> which is makes up a lot of the proteins that we have in our body. There are six different DNA triplets that can code for an alanine. Uh, any one of them will bring that amino acid into the into the uh, protein at that spot, but different organisms use the codons with different efficiency. So sometimes when you try to take a gene from one organism and you put it in another organism, you get very low expression, even though it should theoretically work. And the way you can get around that is by taking the codons and optimizing the codons so that they look more like the codons that you would have in the recipient organism. So um, in my uh, PhD work, I had done that to build gene expression systems to study what I was trying to study to get my PhD. And it became a big thing in early genetic modification uh, or uh, early GMO plants. And that was what Monsanto was, you know, best at at the time. And so my, my, I went from basically being a scientist to being more of a intellectual property consultant uh, for biotech. And then I ended up working at a number of law firms, uh, while I was 
uh, working at law firms, I ended up getting back into biotech because I went in-house at a company called Sequinome, which was a, a big genomics company, and they were uh, the ones that invented a non-invasive pregnancy testing um, that used the blood draw from a mother to be able to give it a digital karyotype of the of the fetus. And it was a really you know big technology because it helped kind of eliminate amniocentesis, which I don't know if people know, but can have a spontaneous abortion rate of up to like one in twenty, five percent. So it was a big deal. And 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 um, while I was there, I was still consulting for uh, portfolio consulting for IP. And uh, Steve Hill actually called me initially to do a review of their intellectual property or potential intellectual property on their chemistry side. And um, and at the time they were the, they had. Uh, it produced the first near infrared um, potency device called the Quantican, and so I was reviewing their their science to see whether or not um, they had anything that was still patentable. Uh, while I was doing that, I found that they had this treasure trove of chemistry. Uh, they had so much chemical data because they had been around since two thousand uh, and eight. And I was floored because when I asked the question, hey, what do you guys do with all this data? This is IP. You know, what kind of research are you using or, or what kind of patents are you filing based on this? And they looked at me like I had a third eye. <laughs> they, they were, and so um, I was like, well, this is, you know, this is where your IP lies. And, and I said, in, on top of that, you could be like, you know, you know using this to, to trend cannabis, to identify markers. And, and, and so – they actually offered me a job to do that instead of being intellectual property. So, and that's how I got it to Steve Hill. <clears throat> um, it didn't hurt at the time that the company that, that, that I was with at Sequinome, in my opinion, had made some, uh, some really grievous errors in handling their intellectual product, property portfolio. And I saw that my job was probably going to be diminished there in the near future because of those bad decisions. So it was an opportunity for me to leave and to go into something really exciting. Uh, I was given the opportunity to come in and be the director of intellectual property for them, but also the director of R&D, which is kind of the dream job if you're a scientist, right? So there is no more powerful or better position than to be the director of intellectual property and the director of R&D when you're a scientist, right? So, um, and so I jumped at the chance, and, you know, it's it's been a, a really, uh, really beneficial kind of um, pairing, right? So I got I got a bunch of data. I got, uh, there was already some very good scientists at Steep Hill that were uh, willing to, to come and do part-time work with me because they still had to, you know, they wouldn't give me them completely. So they had to do double duty. Um, they were punished actually for being good. So they, they had their full-time job. And then on weekends or evenings, they got to come in and do extra work uh, for me on the R&D side. We came up with the Gen Kit, which was the first really successful sex test for cannabis, um, and the rest is history. You know, we we, we were able to um, do some really good work, and and I think that's what brings me here is 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 trying to share some of that knowledge. You know, um, a lot of our data that we that we publish always. In fact, first of all, all of our data is actually um, academically oriented, right? So so we we have a a very um, deep desire to share what we have learned and what we learn with the industry, right? So obviously we have to pay for R&D, and so we build marker tests and stuff like that that people can use to help themselves breed. You know, ultimately, all of our data is, is published in academic journals, and, and, and then on top of that, once we release data academically, we put it all up for anybody to get to on OCP. So, you know, we are all about sharing our data with the industry and, and making everybody better because of it and helping people understand the power of that science and what it can do for them. So, What, what I wanted to ask you was these uh, genetic markers that you're talking about, uh, essentially what you're saying is the, with using, utilizing these markers, um, a, a grower with the help of a lab like yourself is able to go back in then and uh, identify specific traits. So there might be a marker associated with a trait relating to, let's say, resistance to mold or mildew or uh, yield or plant height. Is that, is that sort of correct in, in describing what you're, what you're saying? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So let, let's take it a step further. Um, so, and anything that you can observe 
in the cannabis plant has or is tied to one or more genes, right? So every observable trait, which we call a phenotype, right, can be, it has the potential, I don't want to say can be, but has the potential um, to be controlled through a breeding program, okay? Now, a plant height, so let's take, you know, if you look at the classical definition of sativas and indicas, right, there's the height, the height difference right there. So there are genes that are responsible for internode length and, you know, everything, you know, flowering time, um, you know, trichome development, how, how many trichomes you get per, per square centimeter. All of those things have some genetic basis. Now, not all the time do you have allelic variation. So what do I mean by allelic variation? Allelic variation is the difference between the two, right? So um, if you look at a strain that typically only makes 14 to 18% THC versus other newer strains that now make typically always 25 to 28%, right? So that's allelic variation. It's a difference in the same gene that has a measurable quantifiable difference, right? So now if you can find that number or that observation or that color difference, right? Those are all markers that you can use to be, to breed with. Now, and the way you tie that back to the genes in the DNA is through something called genome-wide association, right? So you, you, now you take that marker, right, and you take the differences that you – sorry, you, you take that, that allele, that phenotype, and then you take the differences in the spectrum of that thing that you're looking at. And um, using, you know, bioinformatics and, and statistics and some other stuff, when you get large enough populations, you can say, ah, look – more often than not, if we if it looks like this, it has that DNA that DNA sequence at in this particular region. If it looks like that, it has a different one. And now that's suddenly a genetic marker, right? So you you now assigned a function, right, uh, which is um, the either the 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 color, the 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 amount of THC, wh whatever it is. You, that's the function and you've assigned it to a nucleotide. And so now, as long as you can find all that nucleotide, which you can through a number of different ways, and there, you know, different ways of looking at DNA sequencing, um, qPCR, you know, um, um, you know uh, sometimes you can even look uh, at it through a, a, a non-direct methodology, right? So sometimes a function is, is linked to something you can see, but not necessarily... Uh, it's not necessarily directly related. So sometimes you get lucky, and that's something that's called a, a linkage disequilibrium. And so that means that more often than not, you would instead of a random distribution, you see that this thing here always travels with that trait, right? And so these are all tools that the scientists can use to be able to build a breeding program because now when you get the DNA from the plant, you don't have to wait for the plant to exhibit that marker, like when it's, you know, flowered already. Or, you know, you don't have to wait four weeks to be able to see whether or not what the internode length is really going to be, right? You can say, oh, I know already because it has th these gene sequences that tell me already because I've done the association that I can follow that now. And so that's the accelerated format. Now, that's not genetic modification. That's just, that's just good, intelligent use of tools using traditional breeding methodology, right? So we haven't done anything to the plant. We're not doing any genetic modification. We're not, we're not doing anything that God wouldn't want us to do with the plant, right? So, um, but we're just doing it in a more efficient, more intelligent manner, right? So, and so that's the beauty of what's called marker-assisted breeding. Now, here's the, the dirty secret that, that if more people had better understanding of, of, true, of true agriculture, every cannabis farmer for decades has been building their own mapping populations, the most powerful tool that you can use as a breeder and not even realizing it, right? So everybody who's been at it for a long time has a strain that they've inbred, right? They, they've, they've gotten, you know, they've allowed it to self, they've picked the best phenos, they've, they've taken that one, they've grown that one, they've allowed it to self, they, you know, and so what they've done is, you know, traditional breeding. 
they, they, you know, breeding for a specific, you know, unique variation amongst the population. Um, when they've done crosses between different things, they, that cross is the base for what we call a mapping population. You take two things that you know, you put them together, and then you look at the offspring from there, the different phenotypes, and you categorize them. You grow them. You, 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 you then do other things with them. Well, that's just the same as crossing, back crossing, intercrossing, right? <clears throat> And so every time you do something like that and you have the controlled observation, you have built yourself a mapping population that now, if you have the right amount of observational data, you can, put, you can usually find a, a measurable marker that after a couple of generations of, of interbreeding, if you can find a trait, you can usually do two or three crosses and, and, and identify the marker um, you know, pretty, pretty well. So realistically, people have been doing all of the groundwork for their own marker-assisted breeding populations. All they need now is to take what they already have in terms of observation and familial relation and then get some DNA sequence behind it, and they're done. Off to the races. So essentially, the the gene sequency just allows for a more precise scientific tool and a quantitative analysis of what we're seeing already that breeders have been doing visually for years. Yes, absolutely. Right. So, but, but again, it's, it's that visual observation that forms the basis, right? So it's the data, the data always forms the basis for the utility of, of the, the gene sequence. Gene sequence at the end of the day is just AGCT, <clears throat> right? We, and, and it tells you nothing. Even when you know what the gene does, right, it really tells you nothing in terms of breeding. Yes, I know I have a gene that makes, you know, THCA synthase, right? Well, but then now I have 14 varieties of that same gene, that all slightly different sequences. Well, but they all make THCA synthase, so what's the difference, right? And so now... By taking that observational data and overlaying it onto the, the variation of the gene sequence, that's where we see the power of genetics, where we can say, ah, they all make the same thing, but that one makes it 10% more efficiently. So ultimately, if you have that gene in there instead, you're going to end up with 10% more THC. Yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, uh, an oversimplification, but, but, that's, but that's basically what it is, right? So, so the gene sequence ultimately is how you follow all the things that you see. And because you can follow it without having to see it because it's coded in the DNA, you can now crack a seed and at the first true leaf, you can tell yourself everything that you want to know or need to know in terms of your breeding program. Does it have the allele I want? Yes, keep it. No, throw it. D done. Move on to the next one, right? So, and so that's, it, it brings efficiency. It brings speed. Think about gen generational, you know, propagation. So, you know, we, ha we typically, you know, w until we're, you know, ready, the, f the plant flowers, we really don't know where we're going with the breeding program. You know, I've got three, I got three phenos. Which one's going to be my best one when I cross this? Well, you know, Nurture plays a great amount of, uh, about about in that you know, um, and so we'll touch on, touch on that in a little bit because because there's this nurtured you know and nature you know genetics versus environment right so those two things have such a key interplay in cannabis to a degree that is probably not seen in many other plants if any to tell you the truth right so um, <clears throat> but now. As long as you have consistency in your growing regime, right? So let's just let's just throw that out there, and then we'll we'll deal with that later. As long as you have consistency in your growing regime, right? You can do the the all the hard work without ever seeing the outcome of the plant. You can pick the ones you want. You can force flower them, breed with them with the known breeder pair, right? Because you have the DNA on that one. You know, get some seed. You know. Crack those seed and do the same thing. Never seeing a flower, but following your traits for four or five generations, right? And then finally getting to a spot where this is the genetic combination that I'm looking for. Now let me, let me grow these out and see what I got, right? 
So, so now you are, you're not waiting months to breed. You're breeding in weeks, right? And because of that, you're getting four or five generations. And so now suddenly inbreeding and backcrossing looks like it does in every other agricultural setting, right? It doesn't have to be you only get two crops a year because, you know, you got to see what the flower looks like and pick from the flower to get the next generation. No, you don't have to. As long as we know what trait matches with what DNA sequence, all of this stuff becomes, you know, rapid generation cycling, and then you just look for what you want at the end. And now that is the way to maximize profits, maximize useful space, right? It, it, and and now if you think of the palette of genes, yes, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, powdery mildew and other, and other pest resistance. Those are all things that we have by looking at other agriculture. We already know that there are genetic markers for that, like powdery mildew. And Arabidopsis and other, and other plants, it actually tracks to trichome development. There's a mutation in trichomes in Arabidopsis that keeps it from getting powdery mildew. Well, how does that work in cannabis? Would that be good or bad for us if suddenly our trichomes are different where all of the chemistry happens? So those are the kind of things that you, you, we have to, you know, look at as we tread down these pathways. But, but, you know, agriculture is built on agriculture. We already know what genes do what in general, other than the cannabinoid synthase ones, because all these genes exist in other plants. We can look to other plants and say, ha, in that terpene gene, if you make that change, it makes these terpenes. If you make that change, it makes those terpenes. And we can go and we can look for things like that because we, we have homology in the gene sequences because Mother Nature doesn't reinvent herself, right? So she uses the same stuff as much as possible. And so <clears throat> if you look at a terpene gene from basil, uh, you know, it looks a lot like terpene genes from cannabis. Sure, there are some differences, but at least now we've been able to use those terpene genes from other organisms to find all the terpene genes in cannabis, right? So, so um, all of this information ends up making breeding and, and you know, um, just even pheno hunting much easier, much faster, you know? Uh, and And that's how... We need to be, if you think about it, because in a very short while, when things are are legal, big ag, big tobacco, big alcohol, they're all going to come knocking on the door. And th these are the tools that those people use, right? They use this kind of stuff. So if we're not using that kind of stuff, when they get here, we will be in a much different situation. And, we'll be, and, and, it'll be, and we will have lost because we don't know how to do this. Yeah, you bring up a lot of really intriguing questions. I've got a, a list here going, but I wanted to touch on uh, this idea that you mentioned here in terms of how how agriculture is already utilizing uh, technology. And one of the things that uh, sparked my mind is I, I have an edible nursery, so we sell a wide variety of vegetables and fruit trees and things like that. And when I am selecting for plants for my region here in the Pacific Northwest, I'm looking at apples, and they'll have a list of traits that are consistent across that apple variety. So I know that I'm getting scab resistance when I'm getting this particular tree. Um, and I know that I'm getting, say, a certain flavor profile when I'm choosing a honey crisp apple, but I may have a little less resistance to mold and mildew. So these are all things that we can know very consistently. And it, it's very helpful data uh, for a grower who wants to grow out that plant now. And I love that we could eventually have this sort of thing in cannabis too. But my concern, I guess, my question would be, if I'm approaching this from a grower's perspective, the, the two things that really stood out to me is, one, what am I giving up to this lab by sharing this data? Like my wife, for example, did the 23andMe thing, um, uh, giving up, you know, essentially finding out about her ancestry and everything by giving up her genetic IP. And for me, that was a, that was a non-starter at this point in time. I was like, I'm not going to pay a company to have access to my you know, own personal genes at this point in time, you know, maybe that'll change down the road. But uh, what is a grower giving up when they give you this data? You mentioned the OCP. Um, for people who don't know, that stands for the Open Cannabis Project. And we're going to be talking with them here soon as well, hopefully, as well as uh, Candor. I have an interview coming up who's approaching it from a slightly different perspective. But uh, could you just touch a little bit on on sort of what 
what that looks like from a grower's perspective approaching this. Like if you're not a geneticist and you are someone who's just been loving this plant and passionately growing this, you know, a couple phenotypes that you're really proud of and you want to, you want to preserve, how would you use this, use this sort of science-based data? So, wow, you, you've like opened up not one, but several cans of worms. So you've touched on things that relate to intellectual property and, and protecting plants. And, and I think maybe you've, you've touched on a bunch of these things without even realizing it because they're so tied together. <clears throat> so, um, you know, let's start with the, the laboratory and client relationship. I think that's, that's, that's as a, as a, the guy who's doing this work, right? Like, you know, it's deep hill. I mean, this is a very important thing. And so, and so you know, um, a lot of it has to do with integrity and upfront transparency, right? So uh, I tell everybody up front, if you come test for me, I use your data and you, and you allow me to use your data as I will to do uh, trending metrics and um, investigational, you know, kind of thing so that I can understand cannabis in general. Uh, that data is anonymized. So these are all things that are in, the, in, my, in my intake contract, right? The data is anonymized. I never, I, I never tried to claim or take control of, because again, it's not mine. And this is where people have to understand the patenting process. If somebody doesn't, uh, doesn't invent something, they can't file a patent on it. So somebody comes to me with a strain and tells me to test it. Even if I take that data and I use it in a general, in a, in a anonymized way to look at cannabis in general and to try to trend things in cannabis, like, you know, Varin production or, you know, CBD versus THC ratios, those kind of things. So, so that data by itself does nothing. In the larger group of data, it's very valuable because it allows trending, right? So, so in that respect, putting one data point into 10,000 data points means absolutely nothing. And it gives us no power over that, that piece of you know, that plant anyway, right? So now, in, in return for that, I, I, if I find that something is unique, I let that client know and say, hey, here's something interesting. You should probably do more investigation because we found this about your plant when we looked at it versus everything else. You have something unique, right? So without that ability to look at that, we would never have been able to find THCV. We were the first to report THCV, right? So, um, and, and that's exactly what we did. Doug Varin, Doug's Varin became a thing because we went to Doug and said, hey, you, don't, you may not know this, but this is a really special plant. You should do something with it. Um, and so that's, and that's the power of being able to use the client's data to be able to trend, but then giving that client the information back. Say, we used your data. We found there is something special about yours. Here it is. Go, go to down, right? So um, there has to be that ability to do those things for anybody to get any usefulness out of science in general in the cannabis industry, right? If everybody, if everybody, if nobody wants us to do that kind of work, then we can't help them do better, right? So, um, unfortunately, there's also, you know, a, a whole integrity responsibility thing, right? So, anybody who would then try to mo monopolize that information and then try to do their own work, you know, to, to go around somebody who brought them data, you know, I, I think is you know, we're having a different conversation. We're not talking about science now. We're talking about the integrity of an individual and their philosophy. And, and, and I think, you know, one, one needs to be asked the question, you know, um, what are you going to do with my data, right? Yeah, I, I think that's a perfectly valid question for anybody going to a lab to ask, and, and, and that lab should be transparent in, it, in its answer. And I say, I'm going to do research with your data to be able to help, you know, build markers so people can do marker-assisted breeding, right? So, um, you know, and, and there's also, you know, whether or not that person um, then would, would be interested in, in, in doing a release of their data. So if so, I have actually asked uh, uh, clients, said, hey, you know, using some of your data in conjunction with everything else, you know, we have noticed that you guys happen to have something very unique. You know, we would like to be able to publish on it, you know, 
um, we would like to make you co-authors with us because this is your find. So, you know, so, so that is something that, again, you know, we did all the work. We did all the investigation. We did the sequencing on our own dime, right? So a lot of this work we've done on our own dime because, you know, so that we can build an offering, right? I want to start a 23andMe for, for the cannabis industry, right? So, but to do that, right, you know, I have to have a base of information like there was with, you know, the human genome project, right? So there was thousands of human genomes that, that were had to be sequenced before 23andMe could start a 23andMe. You had to have a reference genome. So we're in the process of building that reference genome as, as are another of other labs, right, to be able to do exactly these kind of things, which will overall end up benefiting the industry, right? So there's this give and take, and people have to be able to buy in at their level. If you want your data to be included, then you, you, you approach the lab and say, Hey, I would like to work with you, you know, and then, and that, and then, and, you know, and there are NDAs, we don't share. And that's the other thing. So, so uh, anybody that I, that Steve Hill deals with, there's NDAs. We don't tell anybody else. We don't show anybody else their data. Their data is their data. They get to do whatever they want with their data. Um, and then we put their data in an anonymized form into our overall, you know, kettle that gives us the stuff that we do, which we then do go and patent, by the way, right? So now, after I have all this data, I now build tools. I build methods of, of, of uh, being able to follow different genetic markers, like, you know, using HRM or, you know, or qPCR or their DNA diagnostics. It's like the bracket one, bracket two. So I'm not patenting the DNA sequence. I'm patenting a method to identify this particular trait that we have gone through and, I, and, and with all of the other work that we've done, been able to pull out of the ether, right? Because again, at the end of the day, it's AGCT. And until you put chemical data in conjunction with DNA data and you do advanced biostatistics and bioinformatics, you have no answer, right? So that's the invention that we put into it, right? And so, and, and we share that information by making it public. Now, everybody who would like to breed for that trait can breed for it, you know, using this tool. Um, and we help people build their own, units, and, and, and this is where it can go one step further where it then becomes something that's very private and doesn't go to the populace, right? So now when somebody builds their old mapping population, because it's their mapping population and it's only related to the crosses they've made, when we find markers for them, it is their marker. Because unless somebody else has built that same exact cross, that, that information won't be useful to anybody else. So there's, there are different levels. So there's the, what, what comes out that is generally useful for people, and then there's the other stuff that will only ever be useful to the person who actually contracted for that work. Does that make sense? I think so. So in an effort of full transparency, you're a full, for-profit company. You are, you know, this equipment, this science, um, all of these salaries, this all costs a heck of a lot of money. And so what you're looking to do is collect as much anonymous data as possible with the goal of creating these markers. And then, like you said, once you have, let's just say in theory, a marker for powdery mildew resistance, you've discovered this genetic marker, you could then use and sell and patent that marker as a way of generating money by saying, okay, hey, I can analyze your plant and tell you right away if it's going to have powdery mildew resistance because I've I've established this um, this particular proprietary marker. Is that is that correct? So, so I cannot. <clears throat> so I can't patent the marker because the marker is a gene, which is a natural thing. What I can patent is a is a unique process of identifying that gene and that allele in that gene. Right. So what I do is I build a very specific. Um, fluorescent tag that identifies that allele, right? And I say, okay, my patent is on a method of identifying this allele using this methodology uh, and making this, this consulting or, or making this, you know, outcome call, which is, you know, recommending to use certain plants that have that marker to, in a breeding program, right? So that's a very specific thing that I can go after. I cannot go after 
the actual marker in the gene because it's a naturally occurring thing that occurs in the plant. Unless, of course, I use gene editing and make that make a change. But then I would have to show that that change did not already exist in nature to be able to claim that I made it and I could claim that because that would be an artificial DNA sequence at that point. So. So that's where this conversation with tools like CRISPR come into play then with gene editing. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. And that's where you get into genetic modification, right? So now, and, and even that is a kind of gray area, right? Because in the old days, GMO meant you took a gene from one organism and you put it in another organism. You put a non-naturally occurring gene in an organism. Right now, genetic modification, CRISPR, you are changing a naturally occurring gene to a form that either augments or fixes you know, mutations. And so it, is it really genetic modification? Um, you know, I, I'd say at this point, it, it's, it's out of regular, regular breeding. Now you're actually manipulating the DNA, and so that is genetic modification, but it's a different genetic modification than we, we originally thought of when, back in the day when, then when CRISPR didn't exist, right? So, but yes, it, it, it's a completely different set of tools. One is an identification set that allows you to make intelligent breeding choices, but you still use traditional breeding methodology. The other one allows you to go in and say, okay, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to go in, I'm going to rewrite the entire code so that it's only what I want. I'm going to do a single a single pass, um, you know, stabilization, which is something called hap- haploid, um, haploid, um, or double haploid kind of mating, and that, that's uh, it works in some plants. It, it, apparently, it may or may not work in, in cannabis. I've I've heard different reports, uh, but it allows you to go from um, a unique or a phenotype to a truly stabilized um strain in n- not what we not what we call stabilized but truly stabilized as in you know it will only ever produce one set of of germplasm you know um uh overnight basically and in in, in 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 one double haploid mating you get you go to complete stability in in in, in uh, one sh- one shot so which is a tremendously useful tool and we can get it to work in cannabis because that has been the traditional drawback of in the cannabis industry anyway, right? So we, we, we kind of exist in the periphery of agriculture and cannabis, believe it or not, right? So when we, when we talk about a, an, a hybrid, an F1 hybrid in cannabis, we're actually using a very bastardized form of what is done in real agriculture. In real agriculture, an F1 hybrid comes from taking a – stabilized father and a stabilized mother, right? And then making that cross from two stabilized parents. Well, that almost never happens in cannabis, right? So we're, we're, breeding, we're breeding hybrids with, with other hybrids that have no characterization. And then, so now we, we really have no clue of the mess that we've made in the cannabis industry, right? But we do not really do traditional agriculture as, as you would come from big ag, right? So, um, so what we cannot do is we cannot become a seed comp- a seed based uh industry until we get to that point where we have the ability to say parent A when bred with parent B will only give you this set of outcomes right now we can talk about stabilized and true breeding stabilized means that when you breed when you self cross a stable a truly stabilized strain you'll get four or fewer phenotypes back right and a true breeding strain means that you know when you when you do cross a and cross b you will only ever get offspring you know c there is no possibility because they are so stabilized. Now, that double haploid thing allows us to go to that true stabilized in one fell swoop, right, which is awesome if we can get it to work in the industry. And, and that will allow us to now do something that would, would otherwise take us a long time, and that's build a, a seed population now where we can become a seed-based industry 
And so where we can now take a bag of seed, throw it out in the field, and everything we get back will look almost identical, right? That's where we have to be to be able to transcend this clone-based industry. We will not exist as a clone-based industry. It is not possible to scale that, right? Even with tissue culture, clone-based industries would be hugely expensive to the point where almost being prohibitively so, okay? Um, and, the, the, you know, and, and that's why big ag exists as a seed-based economy, right? So, and cannabis at some point will need to get there. Uh, for us, for, for scalability, right? Now, there will always be the need for these, these you know, craft, craft breeders, the ones that are coming out with new varieties and then taking the time to, to breed and stabilize, right? So there's, there's still this, this underlying breeding cultivation um, innovation portion that will have to then adopt some of these techniques to be able to produce in a in a way that will allow us to maintain our uh, relevance in this industry, right? Again, this, the backdrop of this is Monsanto and Dow and all these big ag and Altria and all these guys, they know how to do big ag. They do it better than us. And if they get us there first, they will cut us out of this industry, right? Having done research in a Monsanto building in St. Charles, Missouri, in my postdoc, let me tell you, it's a scary thought to see what we do and think of as agriculture and what they do and what they think of as agriculture. You bring up a lot of really good points. And one of the, the, some of the things that I'm struggling with here with this is, one, as we become more stable, you talk about a stabilized male or a stabilized female or you know, stabilized seed, how much genetic diversity are we potentially risking on losing that we don't know the medical benefits of still? I know, like you said, you just discovered THCV. Well, how likely would that plant have survived in a big egg scenario? Um, and how much of, a, of the medical community are we potentially doing a disservice to by moving too rapidly towards, I guess, that, that direction? So those are awesome questions, let me tell you. So um, let me answer by, by saying we already are facing some of that because we don't we already don't know what we've lost. So a, a paper was recently published that showed that there are certain subspecies of CBD lineage compounds that so by that I mean minor cannabinoids that come off of the CBD synthase tree that we do not see in the THC side. And that is most likely because of the intense breeding for more THC has lost some of the minor cannabinoid genes along the way, right? So we've already done that because of the way we have gone about breeding in the cannabis industry. Um, there's no reason why we wouldn't see the same minor cannabinoids across the board in both CBD and THC because we see some of the same minor cannabinoids already. Like we see varins on both the CBD and THC side. We see... Um, arsenals on both the TAC and CBD. So that means that there was a mimicry or symmetry in the two trees, and some of that has been lost because we have not used chemistry and or science to do our breeding. We've used the seed of our pants, and I and I think I said this earlier in the, in the talk where you know, um, you know, when when the only metric is did I get higher than before, you, you know, there's only there's only one way to look at it, right? So. And so you have no idea what has been lost along the way already. So the other part of that would be, so yeah, um, again, it would have to be an intelligent science-based, you know, uh, project where you, you used chemistry to identify the different classes and make sure that in these in these breeding programs, these classes weren't lost, and then you, you and, and established libraries where you can go back to land races and other things like that, and then try to keep breeding back, going back far enough where before the loss of these things, right? So as long as you have a stable land race or, you know, ancient stock population, right, um, consider it like the heirloom, the, the guys who still breed heirloom tom tomatoes, right? So, you know, as long as you have that 
part of the community still there or a repository for that. You will never really lose it as long as it is maintained and it is, you know, at least, um, you know, you do seed increases and, and, and you, and you, and, and that gets back to traditional agriculture as well. At some point you have to back cross to an original parent because you do tend to lose things or you do t- tend to, to lose resistances and that kind of stuff. Right. So you always need to, you know, you always give it a, a, a booster shot of original DNA kind of thing. Right. And to, to kind of bring that, the, the vigor back up because now you've created a hybrid again, but you created a hybrid going back to the, one of the original parents. So, so you're keeping it all in the family, but getting some of that hybrid vigor back by going to an older, to an older, you know, ancestor. Right. So, um, so as you know, I mean, so agriculture has learned a lot on itself. I, I think, you know, over the evolution of, of, of agriculture as we know it, right? I, I think we've seen some of these things, and, and and if you look at white peaches in the southern United States, right? So that that industry almost died for exactly that reason. Everything became so interbred, you know, and they lost the original the stock. That white peaches, or I think there are more white peaches grown outside of the United States than there are in the United States. And the United States was, you know, I, I believe is where white peaches originated, right? So, um, you know, so uh, you know, so we hopefully have learned from those mistakes. I, I, I'm, I'm making an assumption, um, you know, but I, I think, you know, as long as we, we maintain ancestral populations, we won't have to worry about the loss of diversity, um, you know, and, and, and now, you know, it, it also becomes important for us to begin to educate and to force people in the government to allow more medical research without without understanding what the targets are right we have no reason to move forward right there is no reason to do advanced medical re- or chemical an- analysis if you know we're we're going to be told that you know oh well big pharma's taking it away or you know or it'll never be a medicine because well you know then we might as well just keep it recreational and and then we should focus on things like terpene and experience right but um, but, you know, we already know that there's medicinal benefits. So now we have to have science catch up, right? It cannot be the steep hill or the phylos or the medicinal genomic. Think about it. The entire industry has been, has been supported by bootstrapping it, right? The reason why I have to patent and, and build tests and charge money for it is because I can't get federal grants to do the basic research that was done in the, in the Human Genome Project or with Brassica oleracea, which is, you know, uh, and, and, and other oil rape seeds and broccoli and, and cauliflower and all those kind of things, right? So they've done genome sequencing. They've done terpene profiling. They, they know all of the, the important chemicals that come out of different plants except for cannabis, right? So without that impetus for federal federally funded research, right, we will always be behind the eight ball and it's going to be really difficult for us to to understand this plant in its entirety rapidly, right? And I think at this point, that's what we, we all need. We as an industry need to come together and, and kind of find a way to to, you know, put the final nail in the prohibition coffin, right? Make this, let's blow the lid off of it and, and get money into it because you know, there are so many avenues, right? So there is not a single part of the of the cannabis plant. And now when I say cannabis, I mean hemp and or, you know, recreational varieties. <clears throat> the roots have their own set of compounds. We find terpenes and other cannabinoids that are only expressed in the roots, right? There, you know, and if you go back in, in, in the history of cannabis, right, there are, you know, there are shamanic or, you know, medicine man kind of stuff where they do make poultices of the roots of cannabis or, or, or a combination of the leaves and the roots, right? So because they understood then that there were medicines that came out of different parts of the plants, right? Um, you know, and this gets into the genetics, right? So, so why is the genetics so important? Well, you know, we can now start to breed very specific can- cannabis plants for very specific maladies if we have the corresponding medical research, the kind of stuff that's going on with cancer cell line work in Israel, that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, and then after taking flour and or whatever else and extracting, now we have fiber. And even if we don't have fiber, we have pulp to, keep, to make hempcrete or, or some of the best, best paper in the world, right? So it, there is so much 
there is so much that can be done with this plant, right? And to not be able to exploit every avenue of this plant, including high tech, right? At one point, you know, we, there, there was a big push on graphene as a superconductor. Well, guess what? Graphene died when they found out the best graphene came from hemp. Like four or five years ago, a paper came out that said there's, the graphene from hemp is unparalleled. Um, and, so, and so now, you know, it's funny. You don't hear about graphene anymore. So, um, so there, 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 there's a lot of work to be done, right? And, and the chemistry and the genetics is just part of it because, you know, in order to exploit it, in order to get optimization for growing, and this is where I had said I was going to throw something out there before and get back to it, but now if you take the same genetics and you grow it 10 different ways, you're going to get a bunch of different answers, right? So there's enough plasticity in the genome of the plant that you already see, right? You already see that you have to have nurture being very well controlled to get, a, to get the semblance of a consistent product on, on the outbound flower, right? If you, in two different rooms, change temperature, change humidity, you're going to end up with different terpenes in this, even though they had the same genetic base. So now that, that leads to a whole other level of stuff which is more science-based investigation to optimize, right, so, so that we can get consistency. We can start to look like a real medical industry if we do it the right way. Yeah, that's, that's great. I was hoping you would touch on that because I just did an interview with Jeremy Plum recently, and that was something that he mentioned in, in as a goal of him and his company over at Proof. And the, so essentially when you're getting a genetic – marker, establishing a gender marker, genetic marker, what you're looking at is a range because like you said, the chemotype expression can vary across these different environments. So you're just looking for a marker that is most likely to create a certain outcome. Is that right? Yeah. So it's about potentials, right? So at the end of the day, you know, um, we, we, we have, we might have an allele that, that, you know, says, oh, this is going to make, you know, it's always going to be on the higher end of production of THC, right? But, you know, but that higher end is a relative thing, right? So if you take plant A and plant B with different genetics and plant B is the high producer, yeah, it will be higher than plant A. But if you grow it the wrong way, it'll be higher than plant A, but it'll still not hit its full potential, right? So, so ultimately, genetics is about identifying potential, right? And the nurture is a big part of it. So there has to be, you know, an understanding of that interplay. So we can identify which alleles for each gene gives you the best potential. Now we have to back it up with optimization of that growing potential. That's a really good explanation. I appreciate that. So changing direction a little bit here, you've talked about, uh, you've talked about science. You've talked about Monsanto, uh, big egg, where this industry is headed and I, I don't think there's an answer to this. It's a big ethical dilemma. But for me personally, you know, I'm an organic guy. I struggle with a lot of what's going on right now in big ag already. But I see tools like CRISPR and I feel like it's an avalanche. I, I know they're going to be used. I mean, we've already seen it be it used in a, you know, a human female in China um, illegally. And I know it's going to happen with cannabis at some point down the road. It, it's unavoidable. It already did. So uh, Tweed um, has a patent that they submitted on a genetic out knockout of THC that was made using CRISPR. The, the, the patent's already been filed, so it's already been done in cannabis. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So how, do, how does someone with, like, say, my values or my background around genetics and genetic modification how do how do we approach an industry like this and still stay relevant or is it even possible to stay relevant with what science is doing well um so again there there are there are different levels of genetics right so you know not all genetics ends up at CRISPR, right so a lot of the tools that you know that i'm talking about you know you, you you use them to screen your seeds, right? And then and then after you find the population you want to work with, then everything else is the old way, the way the way that you're saying the organic way, right? So, um, 
I don't, you know, I think it's a level of comfort and a level of understanding. And I think, you know, this gets back to the, you know, understanding the science, talking to the labs and, and, and trusting the people, right? So at the end of the day, we're, we're really just people, right? So we're geeks in white, in, in white coats, right? But, you know, we love the plant too. That's why we're doing the research. And so, you know, um, not everybody is out there to steal somebody else's thing, right? So, and, and, and again, a, a better understanding of the patent world would help as well. So, so, so as long as you have documented evidence that you created this thing and you went to somebody to ask for a genetic sequence, right? As long as you have that interaction, you can prove that they didn't do it. And at that point, so they can't patent it. And even if they try to patent it, you can beat it. So, um, so, so that there's that level of understanding, but there's also the level of understanding that, you know, um, you know, good science helps make better, better plants. Um, it doesn't have to be taken to the, I, I'm trying to use CRISPR and gene edit, and it doesn't have to be taken to the level of, um, you know, um, you know, I want to put some other gene in cannabis to make it, you know, I, I want to put the psilocybin gene in cannabis, right? So I'm sure, I believe it, I'm sure somebody's out there trying to do it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, but, but um, you know, so, so it, it, there are different levels of genetics, right? And I, and I think that's an important distinction in the industry because, you know, it allows people to buy in at the level that they want. And, and that means that, you know, it's possible to use tools to become a better breeder, to, to increase your, your generation time, to be able to improve, you know, your pheno hunting, right? To be able to keep good notes and say, ah, now I have a genetic lineage. I know these guys do these things. I have something that I can follow that trait. And now, you know, I, and it also allows you to handle larger, lo, larger amounts of projects. You know, one of the things that, that we've been told a lot is it's tough to work to do it because the pheno hunting gets so large. Well, you know, you can manage 10 different crosses if you're only dealing with a few things because you can screen for the right answer, right? So, you know, but again, it's you're plugging in science on top of traditional breeding and growth, right? Um, you know, we didn't even touch on tissue culture, but so where does tissue culture fit in? Is tissue culture too biotech for the industry? I see a lot of people talking about that. So, but tissue culture is like the gateway drug for genetic modification, believe it or not, right? So um, you have to have tissue culture to do genetic modification. So, you know, so where do you draw the line? And, and I think that's an important distinction. And I think the the industry really needs to understand the what is available what the things do and how they can be used so that they can be comfortable with what inevitably has to happen or we will be sitting on the side watching monsanto and those guys do it because they use all of this and on top of that they probably will use CRISPR too yeah so essentially not all science is bad we need to understand that science in order to make the right decisions in how we move forward as an industry and realize that there are people that will come into this industry from big ag that have no problems utilizing whatever tool is available to allow them to make money and be profitable. Uh, right. And, and I, oh, I would just add, so you've kind of created these levels. So level one would be, Hey, this is an analytical tool that you're giving us. It's like a microscope or a shovel or, a, or fertilizer. It's just another way to make a decision about your plant in your, in your environment. Um, and that's sort of what you guys are doing right now at Steep Hill, it sounds like, in terms of this data collection. And then if we go to the next level, we could talk about, you know, something like CRISPR, where we're not taking frog DNA or psilocybin, he said, and putting it into cannabis, but we're, util we're making changes within the DNA code itself. And that's something that I don't know quite how I feel on. I, I have a lot of feelings and emotions on it, but I haven't sorted them out yet. Uh, but then... I guess the last level would be what you're talking about. We're inserting entirely foreign DNA into the plant. Um, and that to me doesn't, doesn't feel right. I don't know if that'll ever quite feel good, but I realize that it's still going to happen. Someone's going to do it. Um, right. Like I said, I, I'm sure somebody's thinking about it. Right. So, but, but, but I, but I, I want to weigh in too, because 
I feel like you. So I'm I'm a traditional flower guy, dude. I I don't I'm not a big vapor. I mean I I dry vape, but I'm I'm not a big you know oil guy. I'm not a big edible guy, you know. Uh, and so I'm I and as a scientist, I'm traditionally pretty much a purist as well, a traditionalist, right? So so I I believe that the tools, the first level is acceptable, right? I in my opinion, do not think we need CRISPR in the industry. I think we can accomplish everything that we, can, we want, including knockouts, without CRISPR, right? So will it make it faster? Absolutely. Um, but I also know that CRISPR is an unproven science, and there are papers out there that suggest when you use CRISPR, you make mistakes el- elsewhere, right? Um, and, I'm completely, and I'm completely, you know, well, I, I, don't, I, let me, I don't want to say... I'm completely against, but but I would I would say that I weigh in kind of in group two with group three as well. I don't think that's necessary. I don't I do not think that we need to be taking other genes from other organisms and putting them in in in, in cannabis. Maybe there will become some gene that in the with when added to cannabis makes cannabis like this wonder drug. In that a case like that, maybe maybe all right. But but the you know that would have to be some hugely you know, you know, beneficial thing, you know, that we find, right? So, but again, you know, there's nothing wrong with using a little advanced science to augment traditional breeding methodology, so. Unfortunately, we had to end our interview a bit abruptly due to other time commitments. I wanted to get more information from Reggie regarding the process of how a grower can begin testing their plants if they were interested, as in what's required, how long it takes, how much it costs, and to learn a little bit more about Steep Hill. I plan on following up with a second part to this episode in the near future. But that was Reggie Gaudino, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'd like to thank everyone who has donated to the Patreon account. I really appreciate the support of the podcast. You can check that out at patreon.com backslash KIS organics. And don't forget to check out my website where I put up a ton of information and also offer a wide variety of organic soil amendments, soils, and other gardening products at www.kisorganics.com. Thanks for listening.